Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about predator-prey interactions again, and this time I want to talk about strategies that organisms have for defense against predation. Um, in most cases, predators and their prey are involved in these extremely complex and age-old interactions. Um, predation, though, rarely results in the extinction of the prey population. Instead, what we see is this evolutionary arms race, where prey adapt both physically, behaviorally, and chemically to defend against predator attacks. Um, and what we'll also see eventually is that predators adapt to circumvent these defenses and enhance their predation. One thing I want to talk about is what counts as predation, and I talked about this in our last video, um, but some of us weren't really quite sure when we took the uh, lab uh, quiz. But um, when we when I first say predation, you would probably think about this this experience right here with this lion that uh, took down um, a, a zebra. And yeah, that's the most obvious one, that's the most famous that we'll probably see on TV, right, where this apex predator takes down a prey. Um, but what I want to point out is that this is just one situation where if you take this zebra and you put him in a different situation where he uh, or she is eating um, their preferred prey item, this becomes the predator and this organism, the grass, becomes the prey. And so just because it's not two animals doesn't mean that herb herbivores cannot be predators. Right? If they're eating an organism every single day on purpose, they are therefore the predator of that organism. So I just wanted to point that out just to make sure that we're clear with it. Um, adaptations against predation include three different types. And organisms can adapt uh, physically, chemically, or behaviorally. They can do all three. They can pick two of them. They can only do one. So let's just talk about some really interesting examples of each. First, I want to talk about our physical defenses. So if you've ever seen my tortoise, Sheldon, um, you know that he's got this really tough shell. He's got some spurs on his thighs. That, that's why they call this also um, an African spur thigh tortoise, or they'll call them sulcata tortoises. But they have the shell, mainly, that they can pull themselves into, and that would be pretty tough for a predator to break open. And so it's a really good defense. Now, a porcupine uh, has really sharp uh, spines, that uh, you would really not want to get stuck with. Um, these things are really, really bad. They hurt really, really bad. Um, and it really doesn't affect him if you want to get stuck by them. So um, what happens is you go to grab it or bite it. These spines stick into you. It walks away, and you are left with a face full of spines. And so uh, really, really good defense here. Now, it's sort of the same idea here, where we are uh, seeing a plant that has thorns, that to protect them from herbivory, to protect them from getting eaten either by insects or by animals. Um, and so these spines work really well as well as a physical defense. Um, less of a physical defense and more of a behavioral defense, but I want to stick it in here, is the um, behavioral or the adaptation of uh, be being born all at once. So timing the reproductive cycle of the organism's um, and also producing offspring in such numbers that, yes, some of them will get eaten by foxes or raccoons or birds um, or other, um, other predators, but there are so many of them that you are guaranteeing that some of these are going to make it into the ocean and survive to adulthood. Now, they don't all survive to adulthood, that's, uh, that's for sure, but some of them do, and that's because there's so many being produced at once you're guaranteeing that the predators will get some of them, but you're guaranteeing that a lot of them will survive as well. Another physical adaptation to avoid predation is camouflage, right? We talked about camouflage, where an organism um, is cryptic, uh, uh, cryptically colored, right? Cryptic coloration, where their fur or their feathers or their skin are exactly the same color and sort of design as the backgrounds in which they live on. Now, this helps both predators and the prey. Um, and remember, you can be a predator in one situation and the prey in another. And so camouflage is another physical adaptation to increasing the likelihood that you survive and reproduce, which means you have to catch your prey and avoid being the prey. The next one is this aposomatic coloration again. I just wanted to put this in here just because I think it's really interesting to see organisms that are brightly colored like this. But also to talk about aposomatic coloration is called an honest signal. And what an honest signal is, is that 
it says that it's dangerous, and it is dangerous, right? Hello, I'm dangerous. Here I am, black and yellow, and got these reds and greens, and black and white, or these bright blue against a white background. Yes, you can see me. Here I am. I'm dangerous. And, by the way, I'm not lying. I am actually disgusting, or I'll make you sick, or I'll hurt you. Um, and so those are called honest signals. Now, there's other animals that give uh, less than honest signals, but the, where they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm dangerous, but they're actually completely fine. Remember, we saw an example of that in Batesian mimicry uh, between the um, king snake and the coral snake, where the coral snake was very venomous and the king snake was absolutely not venomous, but they both looked like they are. But anyway, well, aposomatic coloration, we usually call this honest signaling. So let's talk about chemical defenses. The one that we're most familiar with is the skunk, where um, it produces this really disgusting, noxious gas from the glands in their, uh, uh, in their, near their uh, tail. And But in fact, many animals use noxious chemicals to ward off potential predators, including bombardier beetles, um, possums, and plants like poison ivy and foxgloves. Um, foxgloves, I'll show you a picture, by the way, can cause vomiting, hallucinations, and convulsions, and even death if you eat one, so I suggest not doing that. Um, and one of the most disgusting chemical defenses that I know about is the horned lizard, which will squirt blood from its eyes when threatened, so I'm going to put up videos of some of these guys, um, quick, just little quick nature videos that I think are really, really cool, and I, I really suggest you look at them um, just to get an idea of what these things look like. I would have showed them in this, but since it's going up on YouTube, I don't want them to take it down, so I'll link the actual YouTube video um, on Canvas so you can see it. Here's just a picture of what a bombardier beetle looks like. So within the bombardier beetle's thorax, um, that's their chest, they have all three different chemicals that when put together form this literal explosion, and you'll actually hear this pop noise, and they make this popping noise, and this really hot, acidic liquid comes out and it burns any potential would-be predators. And so, really, really, that's that's a crazy thing. And um, evolutionarily, it just almost doesn't make sense that an organism could have such a volatile reaction stored within them. But they, they do. Um, here's what a fox glove looks like. And so people put these in their gardens all the time, and it's absolutely fine to do so. You can touch them, you can uh, plant them, you could smell them. But if you ate one, you would be very, very violently ill, and you could die from it. So it's really actually an impressively horrifying chemical combination. Um, opossums, which we'll talk about in a second when we talk about behavioral adaptations to avoid predation, but they also have a chemical one, and that's that they basically uh, poop on themselves when they uh, uh, feign death. Um, and it's this really disgusting, horrifyingly smelling green liquid um, that basically, if you were even thinking about eating a possum, if then it, it then uh, pooped on itself like that and it smelled and looked that bad, you would not want to put that in your mouth. So another chemical defense. Vultures do sort of the same thing, except they're not feigning death. They are eating dead things. And in order to avoid other things stealing it or wanting to eat them, they puke on it. And it's this really, really horrifyingly disgusting smelling liquid that they puke up. And so if you're already, uh, if you're somehow fine with getting close to a dead carcass like they are, you probably don't when it's a dead carcass filled with uh, vomit. And so um, they don't mind it, but uh, other organisms do. And so it's a good chemical defense against predation. So let's get into behavioral defenses. Some common behavioral defenses include sleep patterns, uh, such as being only awake during the night, and that's being nocturnal, right? Flight, uh, for obvious reasons, and playing dead. Uh, tarantulas uh, are one. They use a less well-known behavioral defense where they can pull out their painfully barbed back hairs and throw them at predators. And it's just like throwing a spear or something. And so that's really, really uh, impressive and kind of uh, medieval. But they can do that. Um, these fruit bats are nocturnal. Uh, look at these guys. They're kind of like flying puppies in a way. And I, I'm not really a huge fan of bats normally around here, the little uh, brown bats that we got. But these guys are kind of cute. Um, but they fly around at night. And it's good. It's a good time for them to fly around because it avoids being caught by hawks and stuff like that because they um, those hawks will be active more active during the day and so it's timing it's behavioral timing that avoids helps them avoid predators 
here's a gazelle, and this gazelle is doing something called a pronk, and a pronk is when they run around and they jump up and down in the air. And this is theorized to show that, hey, I'm a really strong, fast, and capable individual. And so if you are, I don't know, some big cat or something that wants to come and chase me down, you're going to have to expend a lot of energy because I am super fit, I'm super fast, and look how far and t tall I can jump. And so basically, um, it's just an, a behavior that, that is supposed to fend off predators because... You're going to have to put in a lot of effort to get me, buddy. Why don't you go get the more sick individual that can't ca can't jump and can't run as fast as I can. Um, here's the Eurasian J, and this Eurasian J, um, I just stuck him here as an example of organisms that do warning calls, both to other individuals of birds um, and to the predators themselves, saying basically, hey, I see you. Um, I know you're going to try and eat me. But you should know that I see you, and you're not going to be able to just sneak up on me and, and catch me and eat me. You're going to have to try really, really hard. And actually, that will deter predators. So a warning call will not only um, be a signal for other organisms of the same species, but it will be a signal to the predator itself that, hey, you're going to have to put in a lot of effort to get me, and maybe it's not worth it. And so this signal is a good behavioral defense against predation. So how about thanatosis? Now thanatosis is called uh, playing dead. And all of these organisms are actually alive, but look, they look like they're dead. Here's a frog. Here's the possum that we're familiar with. P playing possum, we, thanatosis we sometimes call playing dead or playing possum. Um, this opossum here is playing dead. This bird here, playing dead, not dead. This snake, oh, look how its mouth is open and it just is limp. Here it's not dead. And this is playing on off of the predator's will to not want to eat something that's dead. The reason that an organism would not want to eat something that's dead is it could be filled with bacteria and disease by now. And if you ingest something that's filled with disease, you will get that disease. And so when an organism feels threatened, it'll play dead. And the predator will look at it and think, and especially if it makes some sort of disgusting smell as well at this time, an organism will go, well, I can probably get something a little more fresh. I probably shouldn't eat this. The last thing I want to talk about in today's shorter lecture is autotomy. And it's the ability to lose a limb and grow it back. And so here's a leopard gecko. Um, these guys are pretty famous for this, where if, an, if they feel threatened and something grabs it by the tail, it'll just pop off the tail. That's called being autotomized, and over a period of a month, they will grow a tail back. Now notice the tail is actually differently shaped, but it does grow back a, a tail. It, it doesn't look like the original one as much, but it does grow back, and the organism is relatively fine. I mean, really, it can have a normal life after this event occurs. And so really, that is an interesting way to sort of give something up to the predator, run away and escape, and grow something back. All right, um, that's it for today's short lecture. Tomorrow we'll talk about some cool ways in which predators are able to avoid the adaptations that their prey have. Um, and I think this has been really cool. Again, please join the group chat uh, that I posted if you want to get in touch with me as soon as possible or continue to send me emails. All right, uh, see you next time, guys.